Hello, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Health Leaders, the place for peer-sourced and solution-focused insights for healthcare executives. My name is G. Hatfield, and I'm the nursing editor for Health Leaders. Today, we are speaking to Peggy Norton Roscoe, who is set to start as the new chief nurse executive for the University of Maryland Medical System, about her career and her thoughts about trends in the nursing industry. So hi, Peggy. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me today. Of course. Thank you for taking the time. Um, So let's jump right in. How did you begin your journey into nursing? Well, um, when I was younger and trying to decide what I wanted to do when I went to college, I um, had a family member who experienced uh, a tragic event. Um, And the whole time he was in the hospital, it really um, bothered me to not really completely understand what was going on or to be able to help other people in our family understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I was much younger then, so I might not have understood what they told me anyway, but that really impacted me in a way that I think helped me make the decision um, to go into nursing when I went to college. So I had a pretty traditional path. I, you know, got an undergraduate Mm -hmm. bachelor's degree in nursing and, you know, started out um, as as a nurse at the bedside uh, for Mm -hmm. several years. Most of my clinical background was in ICU settings, mostly with cardiology and cardiovascular surgery patients. And then I um, got my master's degree and was able to work as an advanced practice nurse for a group of heart surgeons for um, really about, uh, I think it was about 11 years. And that job taught me so much that really became applicable in my leadership um, roles, which I didn't realize would be the case at the time, because I was going to be a staunchly clinical nurse for my whole career is what I thought. Mm -hmm. And I worked with them for about 11 years and just learned so much from them. And the lessons that that job taught me um, really were related to, uh, obviously, how to work very closely with physicians and understand the requirements of physicians and other providers as they came into the hospital uh, to provide care for their patients. But I think it also really gave me a unique view of nursing practice from mm-hmm. the uh, from the view of a provider. Um, mm-hmm. You really can see nursing practice differently than maybe some other nurse leaders have been able to do that in their careers. And I think it helped me um, understand how uh, to manage practice in addition to managing people once I moved into a leadership role. So I um, just really now have uh, you know, the great feeling like many leaders do, that is my job to take care of those who are taking care of the patients. And I do think uh, that role helped me learn how to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's an important mission for sure. Um, so who have been some of your biggest influences? Well, you know, there's been so many great people who have impacted my life and my career. Um, certainly when I um, moved from being an advanced practice nurse to being a manager, Uh, and then eventually a director uh, at a a hospital that I was at for 21 years, the CNO at that organization um, was really very instrumental in helping me develop as as a nurse and as a leader. Um, She was really great in helping the nursing managers and directors also um, acquire responsibilities in kind of more non-traditional nursing, other than just non-traditional nursing operations. We had the opportunity to lead service lines and to really partner with medical directors and even many times to manage the contracts and things with the medical directors, identify the outcomes we were going to you know, work together on to drive clinical and financial outcomes. So she really helped provide me just not only with a solid nursing operational knowledge, but really helped drive our, uh, my understanding of finances and service line and partners with partnerships with providers and, and other disciplines. And she was just a great overall leader. At the same time, the hospital president at that organization was also really inspirational, and he really mm-hmm. helped me learn how very important culture and context are. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was just masterful at how he helped um, change the culture of that organization. And I was really priv- privileged to be a part of it. And of course, you know, I mentioned earlier the two cardiovascular surg- surgeons that I worked mainly with for 11 years. The um, mm-hmm. impact they had my, on my career um, and my personal life um, were just was was just profound. They were great, great men, and uh, taught me not only a lot about clinical clinical care for those patients, um, but again, partnerships with other providers and physicians, which of course has been important in my career. And then of course, my family. My parents were always so supportive of all of us getting an education and and my husband and kids over the years have just been my biggest support and cheerleaders. So I always, always have to mention my appreciation for them. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Um, So what was your best mistake and what did you learn from it? I think early on as a leader, I really 
uh, probably tried to do things much too formal, formally, um, you know, giving people feedback. I always tried to be so structured. And rather than learning that it was the relationship with the person that mattered, if, if I wanted them to care about the feedback I was going to give them. So really learning that, you know, I think when you're first a leader, you you try to keep that separation of, you know, uh, I'm the leader and, and I can't be a friend. Uh, and, and, you know, not that you want to be everybody's buddy, but you definitely have to develop the relationship and understand their perspective and where they're coming from. And so really, rather than diving into giving people feedback, whether it's positive or constructive feedback, you know, starting with understanding where they are that day, are they ready to hear feedback uh, or, you know, just kind of really starting as a conversation and making sure you develop that relationship before you start diving in to give people your opinions about things I think is, is really important. Absolutely. Yeah. So what do you think are some of the biggest challenges currently facing CNOs and CNEs? Well, I think our roles have always been challenging. We, you know, we've always had a heavy focus on nursing practice and engagement and, and making sure we hit some of those operational and clinical outcomes. Um, and increasingly, um, our responsibilities, uh, thankfully, in my opinion, have morphed to having input on strategy and making sure that organizations can stay financially viable. Um, I think some of our newer challenges include uh, meaningful participation um, when we're planning um, and implementing uh, opportunities for workforce development. I know certainly for me, over the last couple of years, trying to learn more and more about that and how you can do it effectively and who you need to partner with, identifying those internal and external partners in the community, um, I think has been um, a skill that I think we're all going to need to continue to understand how to develop. Um, and again, just really getting out there and understanding who we need to partner with more actively beyond schools of nursing, um, community organizations, gov government entities to support meaningful uh, growth in the healthcare workforce, I think is, I think in my mind, and then balancing all of that with how can technology help and not be an additional burden, I think are some of the, some of the things that have been top of mind for me. Absolutely. And speaking of workforce development, um, what are your thoughts on strategies for recruiting and retention to address the nursing shortage? I think more than ever internally in organizations, we have to be increasingly flexible uh, with mm -hmm. schedules, with training, with development. We have so many generations in the workforce who really are motivated by very, very many different things. I think flexibility is key. Um, and I think we just really need to understand what people in each of those generations um, need. You know, people need different things at different points in their life, in their career, whether it's from a benefits perspective or a learning and development perspective. I think we need to understand where they are uh, and, and maybe even organizationally start offering uh, benefits in a way that support people differently at different points, different points mm -hmm. in their in their career. Um, you know, I think late career nurses really need to feel valued and like they can still contribute um, to clinically to the workload um, and and help bring along the younger generation of nurses. And I think we really need to work on how we um, redesign um, how we provide care. Um, if we want to keep more experienced, knowledgeable nurses at the bedside, I think we need to continue to develop new models that support their participation when maybe the physical work is getting to be too much. Um, and, and so that's kind of, I think, where the balance of technology um, comes mm -hmm. into play. And um, But we have to make sure we're involving, involving the staff, to make our colleagues, to make sure that um, the, the technology is actually helping, not, not creating another burden. And I just think, you know, for a very long time, healthcare is a difficult environment to work in. And I think we have to continue to focus on the basics of developing a culture and a work environment uh, that is attending to um, the stressors that can contribute to burnout. I think those are the things that we just, we have to stay in tune to the people while we're, while we're trying to integrate the technology. Absolutely. And so what are some of those care models um, that you think would help with, um, you know, kind of bridging that gap between older generations of nurses and the newer generation of nurses? Yeah, many organizations, um, and, and I know University of Maryland Medical System is doing this uh, in some areas as well, you know, implementing roles where nurses can work um, virtually, where their intellectual capital and intellectual knowledge and, and clinical experience can still be of value to patients and um, 
where they can act as mentors and teachers to nurses. So finding out where and how we can integrate virtual nursing. Um, you know, many organizations are implementing it in the care environment in the hospital, which is different. We usually saw virtual or tele- telehealth appointments more in the outpatient setting, and, and people are doing it effectively. I think, you know, we also need to start looking at it's probably happening happening better in the physician world than in the nursing world you know where does ai play a role and how do we how do we integrate that um you know i've I've been at the uh a conference this week and the aonl is actually has a task force just particularly working looking at how do we how do we integrate technology and how how do we do it well and meaningfully for patients and for nurses Absolutely. And speaking of um, different nurses having different needs, um, what role do you think diversity, equity, and inclusion plays in improving culture and patient care? Well, I think, um, you know, it's very important for all of us to continue to work um, toward the goal of having our workforce look more like the patients that we serve. I mean, if we we have a workforce that understands the people that they're they're serving, they understand the cultural differences, they understand what's important to community people and communities, um, and the challenges that people have. And I think one of the uh, opportunities we have um, as as healthcare is to really leverage our relationships that we've always had in communities in different ways. I think I mentioned earlier, you know, I think this, I think um, our, our drive toward um, being better at paying attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion also helps us give opportunity to, to the communities in a different way beyond, beyond just providing care. Healthcare mm-hmm. systems are usually the, one of the largest employers uh, in the communities that they sit in. And so how can we also help drive the socioeconomic health of those communities by offering um, opportunities in different ways for people to join the healthcare workforce? And in that way, we'll help that some of the biggest challenges we have with people leaving the healthcare workforce and bringing people along from a socioeconomic perspective um, and helping communities grow. I think I think DE&I plays, can play a huge role in that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So um, kind of to touch on that community growth piece a little bit, um, we're currently in a time where workplace violence incidents are higher than ever and increasing. Um, so how can CNOs help prevent workplace violence and then also support nurses after incidents occur? Yeah, I think uh, we obviously play a huge role in that. And I think one of our primary job is to make sure that the decision makers within the organizations and outside of the organizations, uh, like our legislators, understand uh, what a real problem it is. I mean, I feel like it's been one of my biggest jobs to make sure that my peer group internally at the executive level understand that this is a problem not only for nurses, but physicians are, and, and other, other people in the environment are, are victims of workplace violence, whether it's verbal or physical, every single day. And I think mm-hmm. just keeping it top of mind, keeping people uh, aware of the fact that not only might we need to invest in some systems, some some physical hard systems that help with that and additional security personnel and things like that. But also it's really important to invest in training for our people at the mm-hmm. front line so they understand how to recognize early signs that they might be in a, you know, a, a less safe or a dangerous situation and how to respond to it. Um, mm-hmm. And, and you know, we've done some work um, uh, where, where I am at currently to uh, really work with our local and state legislators to help them understand. Um, because I think one of the challenges is once there is an incident, historically, I think healthcare workers have, have kind of just assumed this is part of the job and, and that they mm. didn't have the right or maybe shouldn't go ahead and, and pursue charges on a patient. But we need to be really supportive of people um, in, in their response and help them um, decide how they want to handle that. And of course, provide whatever... Um, uh, psychological, compassionate, physical, compassionate care that, mm-hmm. that they need. But we have to keep talking to, to talking to the people at the front line to understand the incidents and, and to help them to really understand the importance of reporting. Um, so we mm-hmm. help them address this together. Absolutely. That's interesting to me that um, nurses kind of think that that's just part of the job. Um, why do you think that is? Um, you know, I think I think it comes from a place of of you know they're really trying to care for people and they understand what be, what might be contributing to someone's mm-hmm. um, uh, a- acting out or or striking out and sometimes it's physical sometimes it's psychiatric sometimes it's frustration um, mm-hmm. and it's and and historically I think in some communities when nurses did want to pursue um, there wasn't a lot of um, 
response from from people in the community. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think as a CNO and as other healthcare leaders, it's really important for us to make sure that our local uh, officials, whether it's um, our partners in the police department or, you know, mayor's offices or state legislators understand that this is a real issue and um, mm -hmm. we need help with it. And, and it needs to it, it needs to be um, it's it's a crisis for healthcare workers across the country and and we need help and they need to help us address it. Absolutely. So um, we've mentioned flexibility a little bit and well-being. So how can health systems, um, what can health systems do to overall um, increase nurse well-being and promote better work-life balance? Yeah, I think, you know, um, work-life well-being is, is, is something that we have to focus on. Again, I mentioned earlier, we, we absolutely have to start by ensuring respectful, safe work environments internally mm -hmm. so people experience less burnout. That's part of, you know, developing a culture of safety and a culture of respect through uh, no matter across disciplines, um, mm -hmm. from our environmental services workers to our neurosurgeons and everyone in between, you know, we need to have a respectful environment and that's the job of the healthcare leaders to help create that culture. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, we, we really absolutely We'll always need to continue to focus on that. Um, and, and part of that also, you know, people have been stressed and burnout has been higher over the last couple of years because mm -hmm. we've had workforce issues and workload issues. So we need to, you know, continue to create um, um, different different ways of doing the work, spreading the work differently so, so we can uh, reduce some of that workload and some of that frustration. And um, of course, training, I think I, I have a real passion for really making sure that we're attending to the needs of our leaders and training them to be more in tune with their emotional intelligence so they also can be better at recognizing the needs of team members, um, which is crucial because, you know, very often, especially at the front line, our leaders are, are just as stressed out and burned out and um, really helping them focusing on developing their own emotional intelligence and resilience, I think, is a huge part of um, balancing that, that, that balance at work. Um, mm -hmm. And as we recover uh, the workload issues, I think people will feel less stressed about working extra and all those things, which will help with their work-life balance. And again, I mentioned earlier, I think they need to be flexible with people's schedules and their benefit needs uh, for where they are in their life is, is going to be continue to be important for us. Absolutely. So speaking of um, offsetting workload for nurses, uh, what new technologies do you foresee changing the landscape of nursing? Well, I know a lot of people, um, as I mentioned earlier, are, are working a lot with how do we use virtual nursing? How can they offload mm -hmm. some of the some of the whether it's documentation, some of the um, work that can be that is more the talking and teaching work of nursing um, that we can certainly implement some virtual nursing roles to do. Um, I think AI will play a role. I think we're at the very mm -hmm. uh, beginning of understanding what that role is and how it can impact nursing. But I think the most important thing uh, that we need to do uh, is make sure that as we're um, investigating technology, we include people doing the work to understand if this is really going to help or is it really going to be a burden? Because I think oftentimes with technology, we mm -hmm. implement something that that's kind of cool at the beginning, but it maybe doesn't necessarily make things easier or more efficient. So I think we've got to be really careful about how we develop it and who we who we put on the teams as we develop different technological solutions. You know, you know, we lots of places have implemented, you know, the uh, robots for gathering supplies and things like that. And mm -hmm. anything we can do uh, to develop technologies or new roles that take non-nursing tasks away from nurses, I think it is really important. We need we need them focusing on on the work that it takes a nurse to do. So I think um, that will also help with um, the balance and technology might be able to help with some of that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The robots are really cool though. I got to yeah. admit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So to pivot back to you personally, um, mm -hmm. what are you most proud of? Well, I've really always been most proud of the teams I've had the privilege to support. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, from the frontline nursing teams to the, to the leaders I've been able to work with. And I'd say a week doesn't go by that I don't hear about a nurse who did something just really extraordinary and above and beyond. And every time we go to recognize a nurse, whether it's with a DAISY award or some other kind of internal recognition um, for something that they've done, I, 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 was, I don't think I've ever heard a nurse not say, well, I'm just doing my job. And the humility uh, with which nurses approach their work always, always um, makes me proud to be a nurse. Um, and, you know, I just hope that you know, my work as a leader 
can make at least one nurse's work better. Um, and if somebody comes to me and said, says to me that, hey, what you've done has really made a difference for them, that's there's no better compliment. And that makes me really proud. But I've worked with some great teams and the teams at the front mm-hmm. line um, always make me proud. Absolutely. Yeah. So my last question is, do you have any advice for CNOs and CNEs? I'll try to come up with some, but mostly I'm seeking that advice, I think, on a daily basis. Um, That's okay. (laughs) My advice is that, you know, healthcare is only going to continue to get more complex um, and the people Mm -hmm. we serve will have increasingly complex needs. Um, So it's really important for nurse leaders to leverage partnerships um, beyond nursing. You know, we really need to work with the whole multidisciplinary team. We really need to work with um, other leaders at every level to make sure that we all understand the complexities that we're dealing with. Um, You know, and I I certainly think, um, you know, we we have to take that approach. It's it's hard Mm -hmm. uh, to, to be effective if you keep nursing in a silo and separate. Um, and, it, and it's our job to make sure that people know the impact that we have um, and the gap that will be there if we don't have the resources and the process in place that we need. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Peggy, for your time. I'm really sure. grateful to have had this opportunity to hear thank your insights. And thank, um, you. thank you so much to our audience for listening. All right. Thank you.